what can somebody do in a situation like that where one uh, party wants to sell and the other party doesn't? Assuming it's not a divorce, right? This is not applicable for like if the property is like a husband and wife, I would imagine. Hi, everybody. This is Jose Luis Morales. Welcome back to the Morales Group Show. Uh, this is episode number 66. Today, we've got a very special guest. Her name is Jennifer Felton. Uh, she is a local attorney here in Southern uh, California with an emphasis in real estate uh, brokerage law and real estate law. And uh, today, she's got a very special topic for us. The topic is partition actions. Uh, which basically means one owner wants to sell a property. The other owner may not want to sell the property. What do you do? We get this question quite often. People uh, ask us for advice, and uh, we're going to be explaining that process to you guys in this episode. Uh, if you've liked previous episodes, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. Uh, it would help us out tremendously. Welcome to the show, Jennifer. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Jose? Doing, doing well as well, too. Um, so I, I just wanted to give our viewers a little bit of background about who you are and how you uh, got into real estate law. So if you would just start off with a quick introduction. Uh, yeah. Who is Felton and, and uh, how did you stumble upon uh, the real estate law field? Yes. Well, I, I don't think most people plan to get into the in real estate, right? I mean, it's not like I'm going to be a real estate agent when I'm grow up, right? Um, you know, I actually started in title and escrow, right? And that's even less people even know what title and escrow is, <laughs> let alone it's a job, right? So yeah. I started out as an escrow officer and I did that for 15 years before I went to law school and became an attorney. So I, I was in real estate, was a technician and a practitioner. Um, so when I went to law school, I knew I wanted to do real estate law. So coming out of school, I started my own firm and I've been practicing almost 15 years now as a real estate attorney. Um, and we do focus on representing people who are who make real estate their business. So escrow companies, title companies, brokers, investors, developers, right? The people who make real estate their business are our business, right? And we focus on giving them the best service with a with a background with experience, right? So problem solving, resolving issues without litigation is as much as we can, right? That, that, that's great to hear because sometimes uh, some attorneys like to go to litigation, but sometimes it's easier for the parties just to settle and not have to go through that step and kind of get rid of that mind, uh, that cloud on the mind. So um, the reason I wanted to, to bring you on today is I, I get situations from clients where maybe a property is owned by a brother and a sister. Maybe mm -hmm. they're owned by a family member and a cousin. Maybe they're owned by two friends. Yep. And at some point, one of them decides that they want to sell the property and the other party doesn't want to sell the property. And they come to me, Jose, I want to sell the property, but X person doesn't want to sell the property. Right. What do I do? So I wanted to ask you, what can somebody do in a situation like that where one uh, party wants to sell and the other party doesn't? Assuming it's not a divorce, right? This is not applicable for like if the property is like a husband right. and wife, I would imagine. Yeah, a, a, a spousal dissolution is different in most cases than mm -hmm. a, a partition action, what we're going to be talking about. But the reality is it's a divorce, right? <laughs> It's just, it's just a different kind of divorce, right? And 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 most of the time, and what we see with partitions is often people who've inherited property, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't plan on being business partners, uh -huh. right? They they ended up business partners, and they're not on the same page. Uh -huh. It does happen where people go in with a plan, and as time goes on, their interests change their needs change, their financial situations change, right? And and they're in different spaces. But generally partition actions and when we get to litigation, um, it's a situation where just two people got thrown or more. It can be more than two, right? People got thrown together and need to figure out what to do. Okay, so basically it's just another form of divorce, but uh, it basically just people's interests change and they, maybe they want to go in a, in a different direction. So what does the process look like? Like yep. if I wanted to sell my property and maybe we can go even into both sides, like let's yeah. say I'm the party that wants to sell the property 
and uh, my cousin Jim doesn't mm -hmm. want to sell their property. Right. What, what uh, uh, process could I take, and what and what does that process look like as well, too? Right. So again, as I kind of talked about, my goal is to avoid litigation whenever possible. Um, if this goes to litigation, it costs money, right? Courts cost money, attorneys cost money. Um, so if we have situation like that, right, you got two owners, they're in a different space. If the one who wants to sell comes to me, we're going to write a letter, right? That's how we're going to start. We're going to reach out to the partner uh, and say, you know, Jose wants out of this deal, right? So the options are you buy Jose out, or Jose is going to take the legal action necessary to get out, right? And so that's how we would would start that conversation. Okay. And in that letter, would I include a copy of like a listing agreement saying, hey, look, this is what I want to sell the property for. This is how much fees are going to be. And uh, do I include a deadline as well too? Like, is there like, can, does the letter just say I want, I want out? Or does it say like I want out by a certain amount of time? And yep. lastly, is this something that only an attorney can draft, or is this something that the individual party can draft themselves as well, too? Right. So again, it's going to depend on where kind of the person is at in this process, right? Mm -hmm. If they're if it's urgent, they've likely talked to a realtor, right? They know kind of what the property's worth and they're and they're ready to go. Um, and so they're gonna come in and say, you know, I've talked to you know Jose. He tells me that this property is worth about five hundred thousand, right? So you know, either you give me the two hundred and fifty for my half, or you know, let's list it with Jose, you know, within the month, something like that. Um, and and I will do my best, and my recommendation is always to be as amicable as you can. Um, you know, mm -hmm. kill him with kindness is <laughs> always the way to go with this stuff. Um, and you do not have to have an attorney, right? And at that phase, you. You don't need one, right? It, it's it's if the if the conversation breaks down, right? They're they're not willing to talk. They're not open to the conversation. Um, your your way out. You, you, well, you can sell your half, right? You could sell your half. It is a viable. You, each owner has fee simple ownership. They could sell, but you're going to get a lot less selling half of a property than selling a whole property, right? Half of a property with whoever the partner is is worth way less than the whole being sold, right? So they okay. can sell. Yeah, I, I, I didn't even think about that. They could sell their interest, but it's right. going to be 50% of a property where maybe the partner isn't the greatest partner. Right. Or maybe you're inheriting other stuff, so it's going to be at a discount. Yeah. Market. Well, and who's going to want to, you know, again, we're talking about getting married to someone, right? You know, so you got to, they got to feel comfortable with the other partners that it's going to work for them, right? So, you know, selling your half is almost always going to result in a discount on, on the pricing, right? Um, but so if they, if, if that breaks down, right, that initial try to do it amicably, try to work it through, if it breaks down, then, it, and you need out, right, and really want out, the court is a viable option and that's where the partition action is. It is a lawsuit right so you're going to go to the court and you're going to ask the court to partition the property right and that means divide it so it doesn't necessarily mean sell it though right so people often think oh i'm going to go do a partition action the court's going to sell the property that that, that is that is one of the remedies. So when you go to when you go to law school, we have a whole class on what's called remedies, right? So when you when um, you sue someone and and they do something wrong, your remedy is what you get for yeah. what they did. So a remedy in this kind of thing is money, right? Sell the property, I get my share. Or again, the other partner could buy out your interest, right? They could take over. So the court would say, and and often that's what's going on in these cases is there's a disagreement on what it's worth, right? Mm -hmm. So the guy who doesn't want to sell thinks it's worth more or less or likes the income, right? You know, all kinds of those factors, right? Mm -hmm. So the court will be the one to say, this is what it's worth and this is what, and and then the, the one who doesn't want to sell will have the option to buy it or um, or they'll, it'll, they'll force the sale, right? They will not, they'll, the courts almost never force someone to stay in a deal, right? So if I'm understanding correctly, the first step would be to try to communicate with the other party and try to make it happen in an amicable way yes. so that therefore it doesn't go to litigation. 
if for whatever reason you can't resolve that, then the next step would be to go the partition action, which is basically a lawsuit. Yep. At that point, the the judge would decide what the remedy would be, which would be either for the partner to buy out your half. If that's not possible, then the other option might be to, to sell the, the, the property at that time. How right. long does this process typically take? Like, let's say that we try to resolve things amicably and for whatever reason it doesn't uh, happen from the time the letter goes out would the next step be to wait like two weeks for them to give us a response then file the partition action right you'd give or them a response time and a reasonable one right 30 days 60 days depending upon again timing issues things like that right give them time to consider it, respond, you know, make an offer, those kinds of things, and and try to amicably work it through. If not, then we file a lawsuit. Um, the legal process does not work quickly. <laughs> it is not. This is not the fast way out of anything ever, right? Um, so once we file a lawsuit, the other side has to we have time to respond, right? And they can respond in different ways. They can object, right? Um, they can answer. They can cross sue, right? All kinds of different things can happen. Once you sue someone, they're going to respond and, you know, fight or flight, right? <laughs> you, know, you don't know what you may get on the other end of that, right? Um, and then we go through a process that's called discovery, right? So in the legal system, um, it, we do not believe in surprises. Like if you watch, you know, Perry Mason, you know, they'll, they'll surprise the witness with something. Our legal system doesn't work like that we are entitled to know each other's full story, right? All of their evidence, all of their information, all the contracts, all the documents, nothing is a surprise. Everybody is entitled to know and see what's going on. That process takes months, right? Of collecting documents, doing depositions, right? Where the people are literally a court reporter comes in and the attorney for the other side asks you questions and gets information, right? That whole process takes months. Um, and, and again, right now, our judicial system, especially with COVID, is super backed up. So we're, you're looking at least two years before you're going to see a trial date on something like this, right? So if you really need out, this is not going to get you out <laughs> in a timely manner, right? Um, it's a really slow process, right? We're getting court dates two years out right now. Wow. Is there trial a dates. way to speed this process up? Like or yeah. like if the property was in foreclosure, is that like a way that maybe like the judge might say, we're gonna lose the property if we don't do something or is it just two years out still? And no, there, there, you know, our judicial system has a, you know, kind of the normal plan. And then when an emergency is going on, there's a process to deal with that. So if, if there was something like a foreclosure or um, some sort of if someone was being hurt, right, damage to the property, right, things like that, where there's an eminent danger, um, there's a process called an ex parte, right? We attorneys use Latin to make us sound smart. <laughs> and so an ex parte is, is an audience with the judge, right? And so you can file a motion and in normal times, you would literally go if I if I'm going to file an ex parte, I will notify the other side today, and I'll be in court tomorrow. So I can get a court date as quickly, again, in normal times as the next day, right? And I can go in front of the judge and say, look, this property is in danger of being destroyed. We need to act now. And the court will have authority to act if they really believe right. wow. in the urgency and the issue, right? Um, it won't resolve the whole case, right? It will, it will deal with whatever issue we are dealing with, right? So if it's a foreclosure, the court might stay the foreclosure, right? And tell the lender, you know, we're trying to figure out what to do. You're going to wait, right? They may stay that foreclosure or they may order a sale and, you know, and say, look, we got to sell this. This foreclosure is reasonable, right? Things like that. Um, uh, so again, it's going to depend on what is actually happening and then getting in front of a judge, explaining that and getting them to see the urgency. What will happen is assuming the judge sees the issue, they will issue an order, but again, it will be specific to the issue at hand. It won't resolve the whole case. So maybe we need to get the property sold because of, you know, a foreclosure or, um, you know, some danger, right? They'll sell the property, but they won't disperse the money. There'll be a whole separate piece to determine who gets what 
of the proceeds from the property. So our legal system can often and does often go in phases when there's things like that. The other option is, the, and the reality is, most cases never go to trial. Less than 1% of 1% of cases that are filed actually sit in front of a judge and go to trial. Um, throughout the process, right, with you know filing documents, doing discovery, there's almost always a mediation a mandatory settlement conference and or an arbitration, right? Some sort of um, alternative dispute resolution is put into the mix to try and resolve the issue, oh. right? Is that 1% for like all cases or is that 1% for partition action specific? Oh no, for civil like cases, the 99.9% .9 of cases never go to trial. That's awesome, that's good. To know. It's very expensive um, and very time consuming. So. Um, most people settle. That's the reality of our legal system. What, what are the different types of resolutions that people end up settling for? Do they like typically settle for one partner to buy out the other partner? Or what, what's the typical, um, like if you had to take a guess as to yeah. what typically happens in these cases, what would you say that would be? When there's someone who really wants to keep the property in these cases, it almost always is able to be it's able to happen, right? They can almost always find a way, whether it's them go get it financing or them bring in a partner that they want to bring in versus the one who's selling, picking a partner for them, right? Yeah. Um, almost always, if someone really wants to retain the property, they can find a way to to retain it. Um, and and But the reality is absent some sort of fraud by the person who wants to get out, if it goes all the way, the court will partition the property. The, it's, it's like a divorce. They're not gonna make you stay married, right? They, they will ultimately uh, make a determination to split the partners apart. So that, basically, that will happen. If it gets to the end, basically, um, and the person can't buy the other person out or can't bring mm -hmm. a partner on, the, the court would uh, separate them and essentially sell the property or whatever needs to be done. Uh, Correct. The, um, the question that I had for you is, as it relates to the, the discovery process, what type of information mm -hmm. typically comes up in, in, in the discovery in, in relation to a partition action? Yeah. So it generally in a partition action, the parties are, can't agree on who owes who what or who's entitled to what. Mm -hmm. It's, it, you know, I may own 50 percent and my cousin may own 50 percent. But if I've put more money in to repair it, or I've been managing it, or I've been living in it, right? There's going to be disagreements as to who's entitled to what. So often it's a partition action isn't even whether we're going to sell it. It's who gets what when we do sell it, <laughs> right? So um, the amount. And so that part of the process is what's called accounting. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole legal process where each side will bring in their documents showing I've contributed this much to the property. I'm entitled to this much of the proceeds from the sale or my share is worth this much. And that's what the other partner should buy me out for. So the dollars and cents is really where these deals come down to in most cases. So sometimes it's not even uh, like I want to sell and you don't. It's more or less who gets what, who's going to get what at the end of the sale. Um, yeah. And maybe that the one guy was willing to buy out the partner, but they can't agree on value. Right. And that's, that's where you're getting into that. So the other guy will say, fine, I'm just going to have the court sell it. Right. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, okay, if you won't deal with me, then let the court resolve it and understand the court has all the kinds of different, different options to deal with it, right? The court can order an appraisal. The court can order it sold. The court can hire someone to sell it. You know, there's all kinds of different remedies. And, and often, um, in fact, we just did a partition action and we went to trial on it, which, which I said never happens. And we went to trial in COVID. <laughs> so that's how bad these guys were, how, di how disagreeable my parties <laughs> were in this case. Um, the property had been sold before we went to trial, right? So one one of the, we had two owners, one of them did not want to sell, the other one did. Um, the court, we were able to get, and, and my guy was paying the mortgage and the other person wasn't paying anything. 
So we were able to get the court to agree to allow us to sell so that my guy could stop having to pay the mortgage. So it was sold. The court selected the realtor and it was sold and the money was held in the court, right? The proceeds. We went to trial to fight over who got what in the proceeds, right? And they they disagreed on what they had contributed and, and what their their rights were to the proceeds, right? Okay. And then in like let's say that in that case it does go to, to court or it does go to the litigation. Who typically pays for that process? Is it the, the person filing for the petition or is it the person uh, receiving the respondent? Like, how does that typically work? Because uh, yeah. I, I that's a concern for some people as well, too. And yeah, also, I, can tell you, I can tell you that case, my client spent more than $100,000 in legal fees, right? Wow. It is an expensive process <laughs> to go to trial on a partition action. Um, uh, in Cal in California, in the United States, the, the American rule, as they call it, is that each party pays their own attorney's fees. Uh -huh. Right. So you're fighting over this. You're going to pay. You're going to pay your attorney. Um, the, the, the distinction is if you have an agreement. Right. Say you've agreed to how you're going to handle this um, in that agreement. You can put an attorney's fees clause into the agreement. So that if there's a judgment and you have to go fight over it, the person who wins, right? The concept in the law is the prevailing party. The prevailing party would be entitled to attorney's fees. And then the judge would determine what reasonable attorney's fees are. But that's only when you have a contract, right? Again, in most of these cases, people have inherited the property. They don't have a contract, yeah. right? They're not, you know, sophisticated investors who put some sort of plan together, right? Yeah. Or even like like for those people, obviously there's nothing you can do about it. But if somebody's willingly buying a property with a family member or somebody else, the thing to understand is that people's life changes all the time. People get married, people get yes. remarried, uh, people have kids, people have different financial situation. Life changes. That's the one thing that I've learned about real estate is that mm -hmm. life changes so much. And somebody who maybe said, "I'm never selling this property. I'm holding on to it forever." something right. happens in their life and they decide to go in a different direction. So it's better. At least what I'm hearing from you is to always have like some sort of a written document that kind of stipulates right. what would happen in this type of situation in order to be uh, protected um, at all. Can't, can't, there's no way to stop a partition action. If I'm the receiving party, unless I buy them out, like if one person wants out and, uh, unless I buy them out or the property gets sold, there's nothing I can do to basically keep that party in a marriage that they no longer want to be a part of. In in other words, right? Ultimately not. Right. The, again, so we, we believe, you know, think about land is, is, is a, a finite resource, right? There's only so much land. So we want it to be used to its best functional use as a society. So this is kind of built into our legal system, right? So like, you, you see a property and it, if it's landlocked, right, maybe a property doesn't have access to a road, the court yeah. will order an easement, right? It will, it will, it will, in 99% of the cases, give that person a right. They'll make them pay for it, but they'll give them a right because they don't want the land to not be able to be used, right? We want it, but we believe in that. So same thing with this, right? It's about highest and best use of a finite resource. So at the end of the day, the court is going to resolve the issue. They're not going to make you stay married. Again, absent some sort of fraud or deceit or things like that. And in those cases, you might be able to get attorney's fees if there was some misrepresentation or, um, you know, malfeasance, things like that. And and so, you know, kind of going back to your last comment, too, you know, we, we're, we're kind of analogizing this to a divorce. If you're going to go into business with someone and invest in property, you want a prenup, right? <laughs> you want a contract that says, this is what we're going to do. This is going to how we're going to handle these situations. If what somebody wants out, this is the process for that to happen, right? You want to have a plan and be prepared for the things that could happen, right? So I'm a big fan of owning properties in limited liability companies, LLCs. Um, single asset LLC. So if I own 10 properties, I don't want 10 properties in one LLC, right? Because if something bad happened to one of them, I could lose all of them. 
Whereas if I own, I have 10 LLCs, then if, you know, there's a slip and fall and I lose one of the properties, I've still got the other nine. They're not owned by the same entity. But so in the LLC agreement, the operating agreement, you build in, you know, who the partners are, what they've contributed, what they get out, how, when, right? You 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 plan it out. You you have a plan because, uh, so think about there's liquid assets and illiquid assets, right? Liquid assets are cash, right? Things that you can easily touch, get to if you need them. Something happens, right? Real property is illiquid, right? It's it's hard to get money. <laughs> Of property, there's processes to do it in the right ways and times, but it's not liquid, right? So you got to have it, people who are investing in property should have other liquid assets to be able to manage the ups and downs of life, right? That that they have because if they have an emergency and they need ten grand, it's not easy to get it out of a property, right? Yeah. Yeah, not as easy as maybe liquidating a stock right. or something. Right, exactly. Like right. Okay. okay. And then um, I had a question, but it totally uh, <laughs> skipped my mind. That's typically how it works. Oh, this was it. Okay. I had uh, heard uh, from somebody else a while back that typically the party loses in the loss in the partition action is the party that's responsible for the legal fees. It sounds like that's not true at all, at least in California. Not as a general rule. Um, again, it would depend on the contract. It would depend on the circumstances. Um, if you can show, again, some sort of malfeasance or improper behavior, things like that, um, those are gonna be grounds. In in the US, as a general rule, you can. the only way you get attorney's fees is by contract or by statute. So if there's some sort of statute that says you're entitled, so think about lemon law, right? You buy a bad car and they sold you a bad car and you go after the dealership that sold it to you. If you win, they have to pay your legal fees. It's in the code, right? So it's a consumer protection piece, right? Employment law works like that. So if, I, if I'm an employee and, and I'm, I'm not treated properly by my employer and I sue my employer, I get my attorney's fees, right? So, because we want to be able to, as a, as a society, protect the vulnerable, right? But in an investment situation, who's vulnerable, right? That's not, that's not, so there's not any sort of standard yeah. statutory reason, right? Yeah. Um, so again, contract and facts, right? So, you know, when you're going, understand, like I said, we just went to trial on this. Um, the other side was not being honest about their costs. <laughs> And we were able to show like forged invoices. I mean, it was it was bad. Um, and and so the court awarded us um, almost all of the proceeds of the property and um, and and really did kind of compensate us for our attorney's fees, but not directly. Right. Because we didn't have a contract that authorized it. But the, understand our legal system works. Uh, our legal system comes from the English common law, right? So our core ancestors came from England. So they, the English law is what our law is based on. English common law, I'm giving you a history lesson, but English common law has uh, the rule of law, which was governed by the, the crown, right? The royalty and the rule of equity, which was the church, right? So that's the two systems. So a partition action is a case in equity not in law. So it's about what's fair. So it's like Solomon splitting the baby, right? They can do whatever they want that they think is fair. So in the testimony, if they feel like someone has not been honest, has not been fair, is not doing the right thing, they can punish them and 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 cause the attorney's fees to be paid by the other side um, because it's equity. It's not law, right? Can that person go to jail? Like meaning like if they're fabricating like like invoices. I mean that sounds bad, but you it kind is of bad. <laughs> it's just an extreme level of like what could happen if you get in part in a partnership with the wrong person. Right. So the our legal system, like I said, has all these different layers. So a partition action is a civil lawsuit, right? So it's it's individuals or companies um yeah. claiming claiming things like breach of contract um uh uh or or what we call torts which are are damage to someone else right um the only the district attorney or the the 
government lawyers can bring criminal actions, right? So only in criminal actions can you go to jail. So if I sue someone and win, I can't, I, they don't get thrown in jail. Um, but if I take the evidence of fraud and I take it to the DA's office and say, look, this person did this, they might well prosecute them criminally as well, right? Um, the judge can also, there's a concept in the law called contempt. So you might hear, you, you, you kind of hear, you know, the judge said that they were in contempt. It wow. means that you've committed a fraud on the court and wow. the court can find you in contempt and you can go to jail for five days in contempt, right? So, so for the most part in a civil action, you're not going to jail. Um, there's no debtor prison. <laughs> No, we don't have that. Um, but again, the, if you really are lying to a court, it is a crime and it could be prosecuted, right? Yeah, so you don't want to do that. Okay, great. No. So I think that covers the partition action on most, uh, yeah. on, on mostly. Um, is there anything else that you think that somebody should know if, if, they're, if they're in a situation like this? And then lastly, yeah. uh, what would be the best way for people to get a hold of you as well too, in yeah. case a situation like this and they need a good attorney to, to <laughs> well again i at the beginning trying to work it out amicably is definitely the best option um whether it's with an attorney working with you on it or not that that really is the best option if it doesn't work i highly recommend getting an attorney it doesn't have to be me you need an attorney our legal system is very complex um, the civil procedure the codes the rules the timing the average person is not going to know how that works and is going to struggle. And especially if the other side has an attorney, they're going to just have such an advantage that um, getting an attorney and yes, it costs money. Um, but it's, it, it's, you know, it's, you know, uh, penny wise, pound foolish. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, 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 you know, just like with real estate, FISBOs often, you know, they save a commission, but they often get less value for the property than they would have if they'd had an agent. Right. Um, again, penny wise, pound foolish. So get the right guidance if you're going to be in court. Um, it, it is worth it. And if you're not an individual, like if you own a property in some sort of entity, an LLC or a corporation, you cannot represent yourself. You have to have an attorney. Our legal system does not allow entities to represent themselves in court, um, okay. except in small claims. That's the only place that they can do that. So um, uh, it's obviously something we do. Um, we do free consultations. So if you guys have questions, have a situation, we're glad to talk to you and see if, you know, we think we can be of value, right? That's always where we're coming from. It's not, it, it's, you know, what is your issue? Is there something we can contribute to help you? If, if that's the case, we'll propose that, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's how we come at it. Um, our office is in Westlake Village. So um, where our, our firm is called Relaw. So um, www.relawapc.com, all our contact information's there. I am on Facebook. Um, I, I don't do Instagram. <laughs> uh, uh, lawyers and pictures is not a good thing from an evidence standpoint. So, um, uh, but, but I, am, I am online and, and we're glad as a firm to, you know, again, talk to you if you have a situation and see if it's something we can help you resolve. I wanted to say thank you, Jennifer. Uh, this is an episode that I've wanted to do for a really long time. So I'm glad that we were able to get it in the books. Uh, yep. This was episode number 66 of the Morales Group Show. If you've enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it, subscribe, hit the, the like button as well too. Jose Luis Morales, the Morales Real Estate Group. Our mission is to provide value to consumers and just educate people on all things related to real estate. Make it a great day, and uh, thanks again, Jennifer. Thank you.